Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we do thank you. We thank you, Lord, that it is November, that you've given us just a, an absolutely beautiful day and a wonderful evening. And Lord, there is nothing that can make any day better than to spend time in your word. For we know that when we spend time in your word, we're spending time with you. And that's our desire. We want to spend time with you. So Lord, just bless this time. Um, Lord, you know everybody here. You know their greatest need. And so Lord, I ask that you would just speak to that need. Speak to that need. And, and, and fill their hearts overwhelming with the sense of your presence and your love. So thank you, Lord, for this time as we dedicate this to you now. We do so in the wonderful name. What a wonderful name. The name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you agree with that church, you'll say, Amen. Amen. I, I don't like confrontation. I don't like conflict. Do you do? No, I, I mean, I really don't. I, I'm, I'm kind of like this. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Amen? And, you know, and, that, and, that, and there's, 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 you know, going back to the 60s, if you're a 60s child, you'll remember this. Make love, not war. Yeah, there it is. And, and the thing is, is both are nice sentiments. They really are. But the reality is that you are in a war. And, 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 it's, and you need to come to this understanding that you have an enemy. And listen, it's not the enemy that lives with you or works with you or is on the road with you. When they cut you off, they are, right? It's like, eh. Um, but no, it, it's all around you. You have an enemy. You, and, and the thing is, is your enemy could care less if you want to coexist. Not going to happen. They would rather that you don't exist. That's the reality. And, and listen, your enemy will do whatever it will take to steal, to kill, and destroy. No matter how hard you try to avoid a fight or a war, it always comes to confront you. That there are certain altercations that no matter how hard, hard you try to avoid, you can't. Just because of the simple truth that you are part of a war. You are in a war. Why? Because of the family you belong to. Listen, if you are a Christian, if you are a, a, a born-again believer, there is a battle. And your enemy is on the prowl, no matter how hard you try to avoid it. I mean, and listen, your enemy doesn't care if you got a cold or the flu or you broke a toe. Doesn't matter. It absolutely, your enemy doesn't care. They're coming to get you. And, and because you're a Christian, you are caught in its crossfire. Now this war, it's an invisible war. It, it's an invisible war that acts itself out in the physical world. Well, what do you mean? Well, Paul, writing of this battle, tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord. And I like that because you don't have to be strong in yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. See, here Paul is, is clearly saying we're in a battle. But the battle is in the invisible realm that works itself out in the physical world. And if you're fighting in the physical world against flesh and blood, you're fighting the wrong fight. Why? Because the devil is real and he has lots of helpers. And listen, they're very organized. You know, if you've been going to churches for any length of time, you'll find out most churches are not very organized. But listen, the devil and his demons are a weld oil machine. They are very organized. 
C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, humanity fails into two, falls into two equal uh, but opposite errors concerning the devil. Those who don't take him serious enough, and there's those who take him way too seriously. And that's true. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul reveals four different demonic forces. And I just want to look at this real quickly because this shows us exactly what we'll see in Daniel chapter 10. The first one he tells us is, is principalities. Principalities. These are demonic forces over areas or regions. Number two are powers. These are demonic forces that have been assigned to keep people in bondage and in darkness. Number three, rulers of the darkness of the age. These are the demonic forces that work in governments, education systems, entertainment industries, in the commerce areas of this world. Number four, spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. These are demonic forces working to turn people from the truth of the Word of God. These are working overtime in churches today. It could be the teachings of Hinduism or Judaism. It could be New Ageism. It can, it can be the emergent church movement. It could be Mormonism, Catholicism, Jehovah Witnessism, atheism. Atheism is a religion as well as evolution. Those are all religions. But again, it's working over time in Christianity today. See, life is not a playground. It's a battleground. And you need to know what you're up against so you know how to fight and how to protect yourself. And, and if you know these things, then you will gain the victory. It's exactly what we see in the book of Job. I love that about Job because we get this behind-the-scenes picture of the spiritual realm. Paul gives us this. And in Daniel chapter 10, God is going to pull back the curtain on this real but invisible war. And listen, to deny it is just as futile as to be overly obsessed with it. Instead, God wants you, me, we, the church, to understand it and to also know that we have been equipped with the weapons to defeat our foe. We'll look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar. And of course, that's his Babylonian name. The message was true. But the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. Now, chapters 10, 11, and 12 deal with the fourth and final vision that Daniel is given. And the actual vision that he's going to be given is in chapter 11. Chapter 10 is basically the introduction to this vision. Now, did you notice we're told it's the third year of the Cyrus, the king of Persia. So, and it gives us a timeline. It gives us a date, and it's important because we know exactly when this is being written. 536 B.C. And the message that he's talking about, the appointed time which had come and gone, was Cyrus's decree to allow the Jews to return back to Israel. In Ezra chapter 1, we read that it was the first year of Cyrus's rule, and that's when he gave a decree to allow all the Jews that were in captivity to go back. There were over about, we estimate around 100,000 that went into captivity. Now it's 70 years later, and by most estimations, there's anywhere between 1 and 3 million Jews in Babylon. And then they're, they're set free. They're told to go. They said, you can go back and rebuild your temple. Worship your God. And Daniel had a lot to do with that because Cyrus, as, as well as Nebuchadnezzar before him and Darius, they saw how blessed Daniel was as he prayed to the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now he's letting them go. Go, guys. 
Zerubbabel, go, go, go. And Daniel has been in Babylon for at least 75 years. He is, by all estimations, in his late 80s, some say 88 to 90 years old. And he doesn't leave. He stays in Babylon. And most people go, why would he go back? He's 90 years old. (laughs) That's not an easy journey. So as the first wave of Jews go back to Jerusalem, look at verse 2, and in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came to my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three weeks, three whole weeks were fulfilled. Why is Daniel mourning? Well, the Jews were set free. And you'd think he'd be rejoicing. But listen, here it is about three years later, he's mourning because of all those Jews, between one and three million. Ezra tells us that only 49,697 actually went back. That's like a little drop in the bucket. And Daniel's mourning about this. He's mourning because they basically become complacent. And listen, the reason they didn't go back, there's three reasons. They got comfortable. Don't we do that sometimes? We, we go somewhere and, and we're there and it's, oh no, it's not going to be forever. It's we're just, just a short period of time. And then you get comfortable. And you stop looking around. You, you know, it's like, oh, this is good. I mean, at this time, these guys were so prosperous. You know, they were commanded, build houses, have families. Well, they also built businesses, and they were running the banking and commerce industries. They were running the jewelry industries. They were no longer farmers and shepherds. They were businessmen making the big bucks. So they got comfortable. They got prosperous. And number three, they became part of society. See, there was no way that they were going to leave their comfortable, prosperous social lives. And, And listen, one of the reasons why the gospel is pretty much dead in its tracks for the most part in America is because people don't want to leave their comfortable, prosperous social lives. They don't want to make the, the, I mean, listen, it is a sacrifice to leave what you know, to go somewhere where you don't know anything because God told you to do it. It's hard. It's not easy. That's what me and my wife did with a a couple little kids and a grandmother in tow. We left what we knew in California and came out here with basically nothing. And, you know, and it wasn't easy. So there was no way they're going to leave that life to go back to Israel and be farmers again. Get my nails dirty? Excuse me? And seeing this, it broke Daniel's heart. Secondly, Daniel was mourning because by now he had heard that those who did go back were facing Big time persecution. They, they weren't being very successful. They, it, they, they had not laid the foundation yet. When they started, all of a sudden these Samaritans are coming against them. The enemies are coming. They were supposed to start a monarchy again. You know, and that's why Zerubbabel went back because he's of the lineage of King David. But they were met with heavy resistance. And it caused all the rebuilding efforts to cease. And listen, if you're called of God to do something, it isn't going to be a cakewalk. You will be met with resistance. And you just have to know that you know that you know God called me to do this in spite of everything else. People will look at you going, well, you're not being very successful. It's like, well, I don't care. Success in God's eyes is different than success in man's eyes. God called me to do it. I'm going to do it. Until he takes me home. So what's Daniel led to do? What does he do at this point? You know, look at verse 3. I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came to my mouth. Nor did I anoint myself at all till three weeks were fulfilled. 
So he fasts. And, and listen, we're not sure if this is a complete fast or a fast like we see in Daniel chapter 1. I don't know if anybody here has ever done a complete fast. Anybody ever done a complete fast? No food or water for a period of time? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I, did a, I did a 40 day fast, but I, I drank because you can't not drink water in 40 days. And it was hard. In fact, I'm kind of weird. I don't know if you know me, you know that. Um, so I, 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 was, I know God called me to do this. I was seeking him. I, what do you want for my life? I want to give you my life. And I spent all my spare time on the internet pulling up recipes on food.com. <laughs> my wife just went through my shelves in, in the garage and she threw away like huge binders of recipes. Can't eat it, but I can at least know how to make it. It's true. And after the 40-day of fast, there was, there was a, a missionary who came um, from overseas, and he was, was teaching at the church and everything. And, and so I felt led that, to go and ask him to pray for me because th that was the end of my fast. And he said, you know, I really feel the Lord is leading you to fast for seven days. And I looked at him like, is that really God? I just, I'm, this, is, this is my 40th day. I mean, I was just hunting down a quarter pounder with cheese. I mean, I did it. I don't know, I'm crazy, but I did it. Um, but Daniel fasts for 21 days. That's not the best thing a 90-year-old man can do. Unless, of course, God has called him to do that. What else did Daniel do? Well, look again at the end of verse 3. Nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Let me kind of put this in modern language. He didn't take a bath for three weeks. He'd be stinky Pete. Because that's the idea of anointing is you took a little oil and you wiped it over yourself and you got the BO and all that. So he's, he's stinky Pete. <laughs> it's like, and, and, and the thing is, is what he is doing is he's praying he is dedicated to nothing but prayer. He's denying himself of the simple necessities because he's overwhelmed with grief. He's overwhelmed with grief for his country, for his countrymen. And so he gets down on his knees and pleads to the Lord. And listen, we should have this kind of heart. We should be able to look at society and the world around us and see all the lost souls and be moved to deny ourselves of just simple things to just pour out our hearts to God. It should grieve us, the things that we see in the world today. We're so anesthetized, it's like we don't feel anything anymore. Maybe I'm just talking to myself. Listen. What the Lord is doing is he's revealing to Daniel, to you, me, we, the church, that the problem isn't the physical. The problem's in the spiritual realm. And Daniel's praying and fasting. In other words, when he does that, he is now being engaged in the spiritual battle. And listen, that spiritual battle hasn't ended. It's going on to this day. Now, when it comes to fasting, the church is not mandated to fast. There's no commandment. But you've got to be led. You should always be led for anything like this. Otherwise, you end up being like a Pharisee. But Jesus said this in Mark chapter 2, verse 19. Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come. When the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. In other words, when Jesus was with his disciples, they weren't going to fast. And remember, they were getting all kinds of grief from the religious leaders. But as soon as he's crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended, it's time to fast. It's time to fast. Jesus also says this in Matthew 6, 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with sad countenances. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to be men to be fasting. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, 
When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. But to your Father who is, in, who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in the secret will reward you openly. Now, then after Jesus, Peter, James, and John come down off the Mount of Transfiguration, the, you know the three are like walking on the clouds, but they come down and there's this, this boy with the other nine, and this boy is demon-possessed. And the other nine were unable to cast this demon out, which is kind of strange when you consider earlier when he sent them out two by two. Remember, they come back, they go, even the demons are subject to us. But here, they're not able to cast this demon out for some reason. And so seeing this, Jesus looks at the boy, casts the demon out, and then the disciples that couldn't do it ask Jesus privately this, and we read it in Mark 9, 28. Why could we not cast it out? And so he, Jesus, said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. There are spiritual things that your flesh gets in the way of. That's what he's saying. There, there are certain spiritual things that you're, you're just allowing your flesh to get in the way with. And so you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Him. I mean, and a lot of times for spiritual victory, the key is denial. Get your flesh out of the way. Paul exhorts us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, and carnal is fleshly, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts himself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So spiritual weapons in a carnal believer are like a cap gun in a gunfight. You know what I mean? So Paul in Ephesians 6 not only exhorts us about the spiritual battle that we're in, he tells us to suit up, to put on these spiritual weapons that we've been given that no one can conquer or defeat. In verse 18, he says this, that we're to be praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, this is just my crazy mind how it works is, you know, I, I don't know how anybody can be praying in the spirit with all prayer and supplications with a donut in their mouth. You know, it's like, oh, and lift up Aunt Susie. You, go, you know what I mean? It's just not, doesn't really kind of work in my life. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But prayer is so important. Why? Listen, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint on their knees. So Daniel knows what's going on in Israel. Daniel knows there's a spiritual battle, and it causes him to mourn, to fast, and to pray. Look at, look at verse 4. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, and it's a good thing he's outdoors because he hasn't bathed in three weeks, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with, gold, with the gold of Uphaz. Well, that just kind of sounds like a normal man, you know, of means. He's got a, a golden belt or something like that. And, and some people are going to say, well, what is the gold of Uphaz? Um, we don't know. We just don't know. In fact, nobody knows for sure. They'll tell you all kinds of things. They'll guess. Um, but personally, I think it's possible that it would be like the gold of Ophir, which was sent to David for the building of the temple and things in his palace. And, and this gold was so pure, it was translucent. Could you imagine that? So pure without any impurities 
that you could literally almost see completely through it. What else? Look at verse 6. His body was like beryl. And, and beryl is a translucent kind of gold um, stone, very similar to amber. His face was like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like torches of fire. His arms and feet like burnished bronze in color. And the sounds of his words like a multitude. And this sounds a whole lot like the description we have of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1. It really does. But we can't be 100% sure it is. See, this could be a high-ranking angel. This could be Michael or Gabriel. We don't know. Now, I personally believe Daniel is having an encounter with the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. Look at verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them. So they fled and hid themselves. Wow. This is really a whole lot like you would see in Acts chapter 9. If you remember the story of uh, remember Saul of Tarsus before he becomes Paul, he's on his way to Damascus. And all of a sudden, there's this light that blinds him. He's having an encounter with the glorified Christ. And Saul loses his sight, but those who are with Saul were told they didn't see anything. But they heard what they thought were voices. Here, these guys, they don't see anything, but they know there's a presence there. So they run and hide. They're terrified. They leave this 90-year-old man, Daniel, and of course I could see why he's stinky Pete, but they leave Daniel, they're all alone. Verse 8, therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. You know, throughout the Bible, anytime anyone has an encounter with either an angel or the Lord himself, this is always the response. They fall like dead. I mean, you probably see these guys, if you ever watch any of the Christian channels, these guys that say, I had an encounter with God and I wrote a book about it. Uh, no, you wouldn't. You'd be like dead. To be in the presence of a holy God is, is just something that we, in our mortality, can't conceive. Anyone who has an encounter with the angel of the Lord or the Lord himself that doesn't find themselves like dead on their face didn't have an encounter with the Lord. Now there have been a time or two when the presence of the Lord was so strong, either through worship or through prayer, I found myself on my face weeping and praying. And we can have those kind of encounters every day. Did you know that? You can have these kind of encounters with the Lord every day where His presence is so strong. You just have a sweet fellowship with Him. Now, there's a second thing here that's very important. There are times when the Lord wants to spend some time alone with you. To be alone is not a bad thing. Our society tells us it's a bad thing. But listen, there are times when the Lord wants to spend time with you and nobody else. He loves you. He absolutely loves you. And just like I purposely plan date nights with my wife, we all need to purposely plan Alone time with the Lord. The Lord wanted Daniel alone to himself, so he makes sure to get rid of all those other guys. And listen, when the Lord wants to be alone with you and you aren't cooperating, he'll separate you from the rest of the people. A couple of you are laughing. <laughs> That's an amen moment. <laughs> I mean, it's just true. It's really true. Um, 
Yeah, I won't go there. Spending time in your prayer closet or alone away from your phone. Again, you know, not much meaningful prayer going on when your phone is right there. Oh, I better get that. No, you don't need to get it. Away from the kids? Well, what if they hurt themselves? Eh, they'll either die and go be with Jesus or he'll, he'll, they'll get healed. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. yeah, I said that. I got a lot of kids. Next one up. It's like, you're now the oldest. But listen, you know, kids are going to be one of the greatest distractions in your life. And listen, they don't understand that, but they're part of this war too. And they will just come and pull you away from the Lord instead of understanding that this is the most important time in their life because you're spending it alone with the Lord praying for them. So yeah, get away from the kids. Absolutely. Any distractions... Just you and your Bible. That's the ticket to entering into sweet fellowship with the Lord. It positions you to hear His voice and to glean direction for your life. So why does the Lord allow Daniel to see this? Well, because He wants Daniel to understand what is in store for Israel. And that's what chapter 11 is all about. This is going to basically deal with Israel literally then, in the future, and in the end, the last of days. And the spiritual battle that they face, that we all face, and so he wants to reveal himself in that, just like he wants to reveal the simple truth that when we're in our spiritual battle, he's in that. That's why Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. He's in that. If you're relying on yourself and if you're relying on your own power, you're going to get beat up. You're going to get a bloody nose. But if you're strong in the Lord and the power of His might in these things, you will be victorious. The Lord wants to reveal Himself in the battle, because the battle belongs to him. It, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. See, no matter what your situation is, is you need to be looking unto Jesus. It, it's what Paul exhorts in Ephesians 6 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Let's all get it tattooed. In verse 9, he goes on and he says, Yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. I'm like thinking, man, the poor guy, he's 90 years old. But listen, you, this doesn't, this, you read that and you just think, okay, so he's asleep. It's a, it's a dream. No, it's not a dream. Circle those words, deep sleep. In the original Hebrew, it means sleep of death. That's the idea of the words here. He's 90 years old, and he has this experience that makes him mostly dead. If you, if you remember um, the Princess Bride, Miracle Max, ah, he's mostly dead. You're not a whole of a percent. Or if Fred Stanford, you know, Elizabeth, I'm coming home. In verse 10, he says, suddenly, and we don't know how much time has passed, so suddenly a hand touched me. Now, just as I believe that it's Jesus Christ in the first part of this, the way this is written, the Hebrew actually shows a change in personalities. So this isn't the same person. It's very clear in the Hebrew. This is a different personality, another angel, a, an angel, period, but a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, Oh, Daniel, 
man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I now have been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. The idea is literally his knees are, he's quaking. He is trembling and quaking. See, his hand touches Daniel. Doesn't say he touched me. It says a hand touched me. And then in verse 11, it says, I have now been sent to you. So you can see that it's a different personality. There was already a personality there. This is someone that's now been sent to you, denoting change. And this hand that touches him literally revives him. But he's still shaking on his hands and knees. And then he tells Daniel, he is a man greatly beloved, literally precious to God. I love that. Precious to God. That he's sent to give Daniel understanding or to perceive a perception, giving Daniel the strength to stand on his feet, though he's still shaking in fear. And listen, when we understand how precious each and every one of us are to the Lord, when you truly understand that, that gives you strength. It gives you strength to carry on. You are precious. And I'm not going to do the, you know, Lord of the Rings, my precious. No. Oh, darn it. I did it anyways. Man. No, I mean, but you guys are precious to the Lord. He died for you. He died for you and he lives again and he's coming for you. In verse 12, it says, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So remember, Daniel denied himself. He humbled himself by praying and fasting. And heaven heard. And God respond, responded by sending an answer. Now, how many times does it seem like we pray and 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 seemingly get no answer? Or am I just speaking to myself? Well, thank you. One person said, nope. But again, you know, what we have to understand is that many times God sends us the answer, but because the answer wasn't what we wanted, we don't hear it. If you have kids and you don't give them the answer they want, do you notice they don't hear it? And then they keep bugging you? It's like, no, it's going to be no. In fact, it's going to be no for the rest of your life. But they just keep, they, if you don't tell them what they want to hear, they don't hear it. And we're the same way. Sometimes God sends the answer. We just don't want to hear it. It's not what I wanted to hear. Other times we pray and pray and pray and nothing. Because there's a war going on. See, Daniel, for 21 days, denying himself of the simple pleasures like food and a bath, hasn't moved from the spot that he began to pray in, and heaven already heard, and heaven already moved. And God wants to encourage us that unless you're praying for something that the Bible already prohibits, you know, and I'm going to like divorce, adultery, to steal. Listen, nowhere in the Bible does God, the Bible say that God wants you to walk around drunk. So you don't have to pray about it. You don't have to pray about these things. Amen. If the Bible says no, God's not going to answer except with anything other than no. My word says no, and I say no. Let's move on. <laughs> There's no need to pray for selfish things. So I pray for selfish things for my wife. <laughs> but when you set your heart to pray for the lost or for direction, ways that you can glorify the Lord, 
Listen, he's going to answer that prayer. He's going to answer that prayer. Don't lose heart. Keep praying. Jesus said, listen, ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. Don't lose heart. Then why haven't I gotten my answer? It's easy for you to say, and I keep praying and praying and praying and praying, and, and there's, there are things going, there, I mean, it's just every, it's all falling apart. Listen, keep praying because there are things going on in the spiritual realm. There is a spiritual war going on all around us that we're a part of, whether you like it or not. Why hasn't the answer come yet? Well, many times because we give up. We lose heart. Other times, we'll look at verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings, plural, of Persia. Well, that's, that's the king of Persia. Well, no, there's only one king of Persia, first and foremost, and, and that's, you know, um, Cyrus. Then our Xerxes, and, and, and listen, um, there were no angels fighting with him. There were other kingdoms of men fighting with him. So chapter 12 clearly tells us that this angel is being withstood for 21 days, that the archangel, and there's only one, the archangel Michael, he's the chief angel of Israel. In fact, did you know that he... It, 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 only one country has a good angel watching over it. Did you know that? Biblically, only Israel has the archangel watching, Michael watching over it, fighting for it. That's why it's foolish for any country to go against Israel. Because you're going against the archangel Michael. No, thank you. Here in verse 13, we're told that there are demonic angels that are over very specific areas. Listen, Satan is not omnipresent. In other words, he can't be everywhere at once. Only God can be there. He can only be in one place at a time, but he has, if you look at Revelation, we would say hundreds of millions of, of followers to do his bidding. And they all hate human beings. Satan hates you. He hates from the very the day one the least and the weakest of the human race is the object of God's affection and love. See, don't let people look down at you. Oh, you're ugly. You're this, you're that. Listen, you are the object of God's affection and love. Period. Don't, don't, who cares what man says? This is what God says about you. And so because you are the object of God's Affection and love, Satan wants to destroy the human race, especially the Jews, because that's where Messiah came from into the world. And see, he wants to stop the kingdom from coming, so he needs to destroy the Jews. Satan knows that humans before the fall were on a higher plane than the angels. They enjoyed communion, a fellowship with God beyond that of the angels. So he comes and he decides to deceive Eve, which causes Adam to sin, which brings sin and death into the world. Which means right now, right now, even if you're saved right now, Psalm 8, 5 says, For you, you, made, you, you have made him a little lower than the angels 
and you have crowned him with glory and honor. See, one day, for everyone who's placed their faith in the resurrected Savior, placed your faith in Jesus Christ, we will be above all the angels. We'll rule over them. That's what the Bible teaches. And Satan hates us for that truth. He hates us. So what this angel reveals to Daniel is as soon as you began to pray, I was sent to give you the answer. But I was met with opposition, resistance. And if Daniel is like me, I'm thinking, what took so long? I'm hungry. Let's move it along. Well, the prince of Persia opposed me, he says. So who's the prince of of Persia? We know it isn't Cyrus. He's the king of Persia. In fact, the prince of Persia isn't even a man. Well, how can you be so sure? Because it took two angels, two angels to take him out of the way. One angel destroyed 185,000 of Assyrian special troops. One angel. And here it takes two angels to get rid of one prince of Persia. So this is some kind of angelic force that is trying to stop this answer. Another reason why, I mean, it could be Satan. Why? Well, John tells us in John 12, 31 and John 14, 30, um, Satan calls... Uh, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. And Paul in Ephesians 2 calls Satan the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And remember, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talked about those principalities, those powers, the rulers of darkness of this age, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The idea of heavenly places is in our atmosphere, in our sphere, what we believe, what we breathe. So over every city, there are demonic forces, evil influences to, uh, to literally oppress people and to suppress the truth. There is a God. There is a devil. But the devil can only be at one place at a time And remember, a third of those angels went with him. They're well organized. They are nasty angels who want to stop God's plan of redemption. But they can't. See, they they know they can't. They know they've lost. So what do they do now? Well, they try and hinder God's plan at every turn. They try and destroy a Christian's witness. They try and get them to backslide. They try and give them to give up and, and just walk away. They want to destroy as many Christians as possible. And then listen, keep even more from coming to Christ. That's what they do. And that's what's going on all around us. Listen, and, and again, this battle is in the spiritual plane. And that's why we need to pray for our kids. We need to pray for these people because these demons don't want your kids saved. They don't want them walking with the Lord. The implications of Daniel 10 is very clear. It's like night and day. There are demonic forces assigned to nations and cities. There is a prince of Washington, D.C. There's a prince of New York, Las Vegas, San Francisco. There is a prince of Phoenix which is why Phoenix is the fifth most ungodly city in the nation. Yeah. Portland's number one. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, we read this. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And that's some scary stuff. You know what I mean? The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 
In verse 14, he goes on, he says, Now I have come to make you to understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. See, because of Daniel's heart for his countrymen, his heart for the Jews and, and Israel, God sends the angel to tell him what will happen to the Jews in the future and in the last of days. So he's going to get to see everything all the way down to the kingdom come. That's pretty intense, especially when you're looking at this is written in, you know, 536 B.C. You see things you're like thinking, holy cow, what is that? In verse 15, it says, and when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly one having the likeness of the son of man, son of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth. And I spoke and saying to him who stood before me, my Lord. Now, that's, that's the lowercase L-O-R-D in the Hebrew, it's sir. So he's literally saying, sir, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me. And I've tr I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now nor is any breath left in me. Then again, one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched me and strengthened me. He's so overwhelmed with the vision that's given to him that it literally sucked the life out of him. I mean, it's like he's standing there, has, and, and, the, and the picture is this. He's standing there, he's shaking, his head is down. His head is down, and he's wondering, am I alive or am I dead? And the angel touches him to strengthen him. And throughout the Bible, we see that physical strength is dependent on spiritual strength. Spiritual strength is not dependent on the physical. Physic spiritual faith gives strength to the physical. If I think I said that right if I didn't move it around, but physical strength is always dependent on the spiritual. So what does this angel say to Daniel? Look at verse 19. And he said, O man greatly beloved, precious to the Lord, fear not, peace, literally shalom be to you. Be strong, yes, be strong. So when he had spoken to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Just the simple truth that God loves you should revive you and should strengthen you to continue on the faith and in the ministry that God has for you. It did for Daniel, who's 90 years old. I don't know if any of us here are 90 years old. Anybody close? Nobody's going to admit it anyway. So, <laughs> But it should strengthen us. It really should, that you are precious to the Lord, that He loves you. That should strengthen you to say, I'm going to be like Moses, and my ministry begins now. Boom! Verse 20, then He said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. In other words, the war's not over. I got to go back and battle. The war continues. And this angel is going to go and he's going to fight the demon of Persia, which literally opens the door for the demon of Greece to come, which is some 200 years away. In verse 21, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth you should underline that in your Bible. No one upholds me against these except for Michael, your prince. Three things here. First and foremost, Michael is clearly introduced as the angel over Israel, just as the prince of Persia, Michael, your, and remember Daniel's Hebrew, your prince. So he's, he belongs to Michael and every Jew. Hey, that's me too. Don't mess with me. I got Michael on my side. <laughs> Two, 
Did you see that victory is found in the scripture of truth? Did you see that? The importance of scripture can never be underestimated. The Bible is what upholds you and strengthens you and keeps you from deception. It will keep you in peace, shalom, rest. 1 John 4, 4 says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. And third and finally, prayer opens up the windows of heaven. When you pray, it's like you're pulling out the big guns. Your enemy shows up to fight you with the sword and you get to pull out that 44 Magnum. Do you guys remember, does anybody remember um, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Remember that guy? He has a sword. He's a big old guy. And Indiana Jones goes, boom. <laughs> fight over. Listen, when you pray, you're pulling out the big guns. And Satan will do whatever he can to keep you from praying. He'll do whatever he can. He'll do whatever he can to keep you from reading the Bible. He'll do whatever he can to keep you from fellowshipping in the church. Because he knows that's where victory lies. Real quickly, I read an article by the AAA. That's the American Automobile Industry Association. We used to have AAA, but... They kind of jacked us up in our insurance, and so my wife is boycotting them. You're more than welcome to join that boycott with us. <laughs> Just kidding. But we're very grateful for those of you that still have AAA for when our car's broken down, we call you up. <laughs> but they noticed something because, again, they're, they, they're in the business of seeing what cars and things like that do, and they noticed that over the last years, there's been a... An, a heavy increasing occurrence of drivers on the road hitting parked cars. Yeah. Now, the people were just driving along when they got in accidents by driving into parked cars. In almost all of the cases, not all of them, but most of the cases that they studied, alcohol, drugs, or a cell phone were not involved and weather conditions were perfect. And so they're thinking, what's the deal here? Well, the article is called The Moth Effect. And just how moths are inadvertently drawn to flames or the light, it was true of the drivers. They were attracted to whatever their eyes noticed and they looked at long enough. So if they were looking over here, they ran into something over there. Uh, Pete, no, you shouldn't do that. Do that in your car. <laughs> and here's the, here's the question. Here's, here's the, the principle. We're so busy about gazing at the problems and just simply glancing at the Lord. And so we keep running into the problems. But if you are gazing at the Lord, and once in a while you glance at the problems, you'll have victory in this spiritual warfare. Amen? Amen. Well, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, we thank you that each and every one of us are precious to you, that you love us, and that, Lord, the, the plans and the thoughts that you have for us are good and not evil. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just pour out your spirit in a beautiful way, that even now you'd begin to minister to everyone here. Lord, minister the gifts of healing, the word of wisdom, the discerning of spirits. Lord, move in your church. And Lord, strengthen us that we would not faint, but that we would be on our knees praying and seeking you, knowing that we have the victory in Christ Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We love you and we just, Lord, we want to lift up to the, you the Dodgers. I don't know if they won or lost, um, but if they lost, damn bums, there's always next year. In Jesus' name, amen.